Hey everybody, it's Tori Townley here on The Serve Brew, um, having a coffee break as usual. I hope everybody's having a great day, a great week. Um, we have an incredible guest today, Bishop George Davis of Impact Church in Jacksonville, Florida. You guys may have heard him speaking at the art conference recently. He was on the 7 and 7 panel, and then he did a, um, an app session and panel with uh, Pastor Miles McPherson and several others. It was just very powerful and um, super inspired me. I was like, wow, this is, he just has an incredible message, incredible heart. And then fun story, a couple weeks later, or maybe the next week, I was on social media and saw the outreach that they were doing. And he posted a video um, installing smoke detectors, partnering with the Red Cross. And it said, we're getting ready for serve day. And that just got my heart. Like, it's so cool to hear someone share their heart for the community, share their heart for people, and then to see it followed up in action right after that, and just so much passion. And he's right up in the in the middle of it, installing smoke detectors. This is so cool, and it struck me. So I um, invited him to be on our serve brew today and just share their heart and some wisdom. I know there's a lot um, of beautiful things that they're doing. So Bishop Davis, thank you so much for being on with us today. Such an honor. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to be on with you. And, and, and George is fine. You don't have to, you don't have to, do the Bishop. I appreciate it, but uh, I'm, I'm just glad to be on with you and excited uh, to see all the things that are going on there with you and the team and uh, glad to be a part of it as well. Thank you so much. I'll try with the George, but it's probably not going to be. <laughs> That's cool. So tell us a little bit about your story personally, like as a family. I did a little bit of, a little bit of research and I know you're from Detroit. Is that correct? That is yeah. correct. Okay, so tell us your journey. Like, what what got you there, and what got you here? Tell us about you. Well, well, uh, I grew up in church uh, in my entire life. I, I jokingly say that I think I came straight from the hospital, and went straight to church as a, as an infant. <laughs> I don't know if we ever even went home, but every Sunday I was always in church. Grew up in a good traditional Baptist church in Detroit, Michigan. And I uh, made it to college and uh, just realized that there was something I was missing, just longing for more. And I just wanted to grow more. And so I met my wife in college. We both went to Michigan State University. Uh, I was a sophomore looking at all the, the cute freshmen coming on campus. And uh, she caught my eye and we started dating. And part of what we agreed to is that we're going to date, we're going to go to church together. So um, when we got home for the summer, we went to my church one Sunday, then went to her church the next Sunday. And uh, her church was a church that was really a teaching ministry and it just transformed my life. I mean, after visiting there a couple of times, my life got transformed. And I recognized after being there a few months that God had called me to ministry. And so came back to Michigan State that following fall and started a Bible study uh, in, in the dorm room and in, in, in actually the little caucus of, uh, of our dorm. And I didn't know anything. So, I mean, I, I would take a couple of scriptures and, and read them and share what I could share. And sometimes I'd take the cassette tape from the, our pastor and play that. And then we discussed that a little bit. It was really a small group and I didn't even know it. But it uh, grew from about five of us that started to end up being about 60 people that were coming on a regular basis. And now to this day, it's still going up there at Michigan State from what they tell me. And so from there, I went to uh, Bible school to get trained and uh, to prepare myself for ministry. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm just going to go to Bible school these two years, get God off my case and come right back to Michigan State. And I graduated Bible school and was brought on staff full time as an assistant pastor at our church in Detroit. I was 23 years old, the youngest thing around. Uh, April and I got married. I started on full-time ministry June the 1st of 1993, and she and I got married the next month, July 24th, and I've literally been in full-time ministry our entire married life. And uh, so we were on staff there for three years, and really since the Lord calling us to launch out here to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, with our pastor's blessing, they, they launched us out here to start a church and supported us for the first year to get us started. And our church, uh, you know, thankfully took off and was growing and and we were leading a good group of people here and have done well. We've you know, been at it since 1996. So we've been at it for a while. And uh, two years ago, found out about ARC and was really at a place where I knew that there was more. And really just even how we were doing church, just to send something different. I had been making a lot of changes on my own and got connected with ARC a couple years ago. And uh, with uh, Pastor Chris Hodges as well with, with the Grow Network all, all combined. And between those two vehicles, it really just helped to transform my thinking and has uh, been um, an amazing part of our growth and our success. Really, really what part of what happened with us is about eight years ago, I was reading a book and to this day, I can't remember what the book was, but the question in the book asks, if your church were to pack up and leave your community, would they miss you? 
And at the time I had to honestly say they wouldn't, you know, they probably would have missed all the traffic coming in and out, but they wouldn't have missed us because we weren't making an impact in our community. And I sat down with my team and said, we want to change that. So we really made a concerted effort to really get involved in our community and start being involved with homeless efforts. And uh, we do a lot with human trafficking efforts um, with orphanages and to help stem the tide of abortion. Those are kind of kind of the four major things that we really have a passion for. And so we really started getting more involved in the community. And we got to the place to where we, have, we were doing so much in the community that we felt like the name of our church didn't fit our mission anymore. So at the time, our church was Faith Christian Center back then. And um, the Lord just impressed upon my heart to change the name of the church to Impact Church so that uh, even as people became a part of the church, they would know that our mission is not to stay bound within the four walls, but to have an impact on our community. So we changed the name of the church. Um, I was bracing for all this resistance, and but got zero. I mean, people were excited about it, jumped right on board, and we've been going ever since. So we connected with Ark two years ago, and that's that's been a big part of uh, helping us to continue on this journey. Wow, that's amazing! I love that story of how like God just brings people on a journey, and it's, it's exciting. Like people get on board when there's vision, and so I think that's so cool. Um, how you just follow God's lead and he blessed it. And it's, it's like just reading up on your history, a little bit of it. I know I don't know everything, but just it looks like God has anointed it so much that there's such a wide span. It says on your website that you guys um, are overseeing 11 churches. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, once we started in Jacksonville, uh, but part of our um, assignment right away was to uh, plant other churches, uh, life-giving churches that you know, were sharing the gospel. So we have planted five churches. We have five churches in the state of Florida. So we have one in Miami, one in Tallahassee, one in the um, Tampa area, um, one in Orlando area, which is actually a campus for, for Jacksonville, and then the Jacksonville church. And then going up the East Coast, we have churches in Savannah, Georgia, Norfolk, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, um, out West, one in Houston, Texas. Uh, we have two churches in Peru. And then this fall, we're actually starting a church in the Northern Virginia area, right outside of D.C. And they're all impact church. You know, um, it's not a denomination or anything, but they're all independently set up churches, but they're all connected under the, the relational banner of impact church. That's so beautiful. I think, honestly, I think all of them, I have 10 of them signed up for serve day. I was like, yes. impact church, impact church, impact church. <laughs> it just speaks so much of the vision and the heart. Like that permeates that DNA of just, we're all about reaching people. Um, so why, why Florida? Do you know why? Or was it just God said Florida? Uh, purely God said Florida. I mean, I didn't do any demographic studies, didn't do any trends on the fastest growing cities. <laughs> that um, actually knew nothing about Jacksonville other than the year before we moved here, they had just gotten a football team. So that was a bonus that uh, we got a chance to have professional football here coming from Detroit. Uh, but I knew nothing about Jacksonville other than the, the Lord pl placed his place on our heart. And it was actually on my pastor's heart as well. And uh, so he, he was looking to send us out, but didn't want to tell us what city, wanted us to get it in prayer. And he came in my office one day to tell me what the city was. And before he could tell me, I told him that it's, uh, it's Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, so he had confirmation about it and peace about it. And so did I and my wife. And uh, we launched out here with 12 adults that packed up and moved from Detroit. They all came in and got jobs here to, to help us you know, start a church. And uh, we, we jokingly say we had a launch team before we even knew anything about a launch team. But uh, they came here and helped us to get the church started. And, and almost all of them are still connected with us, either uh, full-time employees on our staff here. Uh, one or two of them are actually senior pastors of the churches that we planted. My church down in Miami, uh, the guy who's there came with us from day one from Detroit and became uh, assistant pastor here, youth pastor here. And then we eventually set him up in Miami to uh, start his own church. And they're doing well down there. Man, that is incredible. Incredible. Just the, the relationship and... I don't know, like it's just, it's so unique and it's so cool to hear how just, I always, I always love the story of like how God called people places because it's always different. Like it's, you know, it's God, but it's always different. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it's just random and crazy. And so I just love to hear that. You're just, I don't know, God just said it and I did it. And clearly it was the right decision because you're reaching the whole state, you're reaching the country and the world. There's so many different ministries you guys have going on. And you've written books and um you're also are you like a singer? You have a <laughs> I've <done> my research. <laughs> you've been doing your homework. <laughs> 
For real. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple couple books that I've written. I um, had a little small book years ago that I wrote called Holy Ghost Buoyancy, um, which is, uh, I believe God gives us this bounce back ability that no matter how many times you get pushed down, the spirit of God within us keeps us bouncing back up. Then I wrote a book uh, several years ago uh, called Lord Save Me For Me, that uh, I'm the biggest problem. The devil is not my biggest problem. Other people are, are my biggest problem, but it's really me. And if I can learn to discipline myself and fully submit and yield to God, then God knows how to work everything else out. And then the most recent one I wrote several years ago is called Passing the Test of Life. And I believe that they're tests that we all go through, uh, that if we learn how to handle them the way God's word wants us to handle them, then we'll pass those tests, get promoted in the kingdom of God, and uh, continue watching God do you know, amazing things in our lives. And then I, I dibble a little bit in music. I, I, I you know, sang on a praise team at our church in Michigan years ago and just kind of always had this uh, dream or desire in my heart to release a music project. And... So finally, about four years ago, I slowed down long enough to actually go into the studio and record a, a music project. And again, I'm thinking I'm just recording it to get it out of my heart and finally say I did it and sell them around the church and um, ended up taking one of the songs and uh, putting it, uh, taking it to radio with it. And that actually did pretty well and became, I think, number 27 or 28 on the gospel billboard chart. So uh, that was a surprise to me, but it uh, did okay. <laughs> You make ministry sound like a blast. Everybody, we all talk about like, oh, it's hard, it's hard work, and it really is, but it just sounds like an adventure when you talk about it. Like I said, yes, and then this happened, and that happened. You just, <laughs> it's just so cool. It's exciting. Well, I'm, I'm, giving you the, I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. In between, <laughs> in between each of those victories and great celebration mountains, there have been some valleys that uh, we had to pray ourselves through, and then God had to show his faithfulness to get us through them. But I think all of that is, is, is what makes for the journey. Um, I don't think you end up, it's our 25th year in ministry and 25th year married this year. And I don't think you end up around that long without you know, going through some battles and, and getting a chance to see God be faithful even in the tough times. And I guess if I could take a quick ministry moment, I would share with any other leader that's watching this, that no matter how tough you feel like it is right now, don't you dare give up. Um, so I think we never know how close we are to that next explosion of victory uh, because the enemy, you know, one thing I realized is that the devil is not all knowing, you know, you know, God is omniscient. He knows everything. And sometimes the way we've kind of created the enemy in our mind, we almost treat him like he's all knowing, but he's not, he doesn't know what we're thinking. He doesn't know what we're feeling. I do believe he has access to the mental realm to, to try to interject thoughts to see how we'll respond to him. I, th I think that's what happened in, in Matthew four with Jesus when he had been tempted, we had been fasting, and then the Bible says he was tempted of the devil. And the tempter said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Well, how did he say that to Jesus? I mean, we, we don't have any record of him turning into a serpent like he did in the garden. So I, I believe he must have interjected thoughts into Jesus' mind. If you're really who you think you are, turn, turn, prove it, turn these stones into bread. And if you're really the son of God, throw yourself off of this, this pinnacle, this mountain, and God will, God will protect you. And so I believe that the devil, he can't read our thoughts, but every now and then he'll try to interject thoughts into our minds to see how we'll respond to them. And I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that, you know, God has created us with victory. And, and, and because the devil can't read our minds, he's a spirit being. And I think when things start to get close, like, like right now, I mean, you there in, in Alabama, I, I can't see all the way to Alabama. But if, if you got on you know, the highway and you start driving here to Jacksonville and you get close to our church, when you got out there to the parking lot, if I was standing up front, I can, I can look at there and go, oh, there she is right there. When something gets close enough in the physical realm, I can see it. When something gets close enough in the spiritual realm, I think the devil can see it. And I think that's when he turns up the pressure the most. That's when he tries to get us distracted. That's when he tries to bring attacks our way. That's when he tries to get persecution coming our way. Because when we're really close to that next level of breakthrough, he's doing everything he can to get us to quit. So my, lo my little word of, of ministry and encouragement to any leaders that are out there is if you're really feeling the pressure right now, I think it's probably because you're so close to your next level of breakthrough, your next level of manifestation. And the enemy knows he can't stop you on his own. Only thing he can do is try to get you discouraged, get you distracted, to get you to give up and quit. Don't dare give in to it. Keep pushing, keep fighting as God is faithful. Wow. Wow, that was so good so good I think that that probably is meant for at least one person if not a bajillion who's going to watch this um so deep thank you for that uh, so okay I think with that thought it just shows to me so much of like your heart for people and what they're going through and encouraging them and just saying hey I know it's hard but here's a way to get through it and that kind of goes with 
why you were called to Florida because of the people who are broken and the lost and the ones who just don't know how to get back up. So with that, what, what are the things in Florida, in Jacksonville, wherever you're doing ministry that really just like pulls on your heartstrings, whether it's you personally or just you guys as a church. I know you said there's the four focus areas of outreach that you're doing and then you guys have missions and stuff. What are like the things, the needs that draw you, the things that break your heart? And then how do you guys kind of bring that solution through serving your outreach or whatever it is? Well, I have a real passion for inner city ministry. Um, I think God calls us to everybody, so we're, we're wide open to minister to everybody. But uh, I've got a background in inner city ministry. Uh, growing up uh, in the inner city of Detroit, I'm a product of a single parent home. Uh, my mom was a teenager when she got pregnant with me. It wasn't God's uh, process or the way it intended it to happen or the timing, I should say, for it to happen. Uh, but she got pregnant, and I'm, I'm grateful that you know it was as at a time when abortion wasn't as as popular and as uh, pronounced as it is now. So. She was pro-life and gave me a chance to live. And even though the, 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 the process and the, the timing on her getting pregnant was not God's best, clearly God had a purpose and a plan for that little baby in her womb. And so that's really a passion of mine. So we really you know, go hard after uh, helping young ladies to, to know that there's another way. You got another choice. It doesn't have to just be you know, an abortion. It doesn't have to be just you know, accepting that well, I'm going to be poverty stricken. So we try to help young ladies. Uh, to, to, to realize that God, that there is hope on the other side of that pregnancy, even if it wasn't planned, that God is still there with you. So that's one of the things we go hard after. We, we know we're not the type that are stomping outside of abortion clinics and trying to make people feel bad or guilty, but really, you know, that group that's trying to give hope. Um, I'm, I'm the product of that hope. I'm the product of a mother that believed that even though I made a mistake in, in, in how I ended up pregnant, my child is not a mistake and that God still has a plan for my child. You know, in Jeremiah chapter one, God says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came out, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. As he was speaking to Jeremiah, I believe that God had this, this assignment on my life long before my mom ever ended up conceiving me and getting pregnant. And uh, how, how, how horrific in my mind would it have been for her to terminate that pregnancy and a pastor that God intended to be here in Jacksonville to add to the other great pastors here and to reach out to the community wouldn't have had that chance. So that's, that's a big passion of ours. Um, I, I, a few years ago, I really got introduced to the horrors of human trafficking. Um, and I have to be honest to say, I didn't really even know how bad the problem was. You, know, you hear about it in other countries and, and you see, see documentaries on it other places, but you know, Florida is one of the leading states for human trafficking. And uh, Jacksonville in particular, being right here on the water, uh, right here on, the, on the, the, the border of Georgia, is one of those cities that is, is a real target for human trafficking. So we made it a real point to go after, trying to rescue ladies from human trafficking. And what, what I love about it is that most of the efforts we're doing are not just from the, the corporate level at our church. You know, there, there are things that we do as a ministry. Um, there's several organizations we partner with to help fund uh, rescuing ladies out of human trafficking. But the thing I really love is that it has now seeped into the fabric of our church. I have one young lady who is getting ready to graduate from our Impact College, um, our Bible school, uh, Bible training area. And she and a group of her friends formed a small group, and their small group is specifically designed on Saturday nights to go out to the local strip clubs and, and actually rescue young ladies and help them, help minister hope to them for them to realize that they, you don't have to go in here and, and, and parade your body around thinking that that's the only way that you can make it. And, and it's been amazing to hear some of the miraculous stories that have happened with them just going out on, on Saturday nights as a group of ladies. I mean, at first glance, my thought was, don't you dare go out there. I mean, that's too dangerous. And they've encountered some resistance at times. They've encountered some, some had some altercations that they really needed God to step in, but God has done some miraculous things through them helping those young ladies to go out there and demonstrate to other young ladies that there is another way. So those are two of them. Uh, another one that's a big one for us is um, homelessness. So we do a lot of things to help combat homelessness here in the city, uh, from feeding the homeless to uh, one of the things that we're, we're in the process of doing right now is working with the city to gain control and access over several abandoned homes in our community that are still in decent shape, but being able to put a, put a construction team on them and get our, our volunteers to help rehab those homes and create a space where if a family ends up um, without, without housing, that we can put them up in a space for a month or two months while we help them get employment and be able to use that as a transition place as opposed to just a shelter. We're, we're grateful for the shelters. But we want to also be able to provide a stable environment for a family 
and then be able to help them get back on their feet and get back into the workforce, take advantage of all the, the employers that we have in our church and human resources personnel that we have in our church to really be able to give a second chance to a family that ends up in a tough place. So those are the, the top three. And then the, the other one that falls right in line with that as well is they got a real passion for orphans. And they, I think the, the Bible says it is God that sets the lonely in families. And he's the one that finds the orphan and rescues the orphan. I was doing a teaching this past Sunday on, on Esther in, in our, we're doing a, a series called Heaven's Hall of Fame. And the character I was talking about this past Sunday is Esther. And when we look at Esther's life, it's amazing that she became queen uh, right there with uh, King Xerxes. Um, but the reality is she was an orphan. Her parents had died and she was raised by her cousin Mordecai. And I think it just goes to show that God will take people that had a really rough beginning and turn around and give them an amazing future when we submit our lives to him. And so that's part of our passion. Uh, I've, been, I've been asking God to let me build an orphanage because I would love to just build an orphanage right here in Jacksonville and, uh, and let us take those kids through our, our, our program and, and raise them up right here and help them to realize that life can be much better um, as a result of them submitting to, to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we, we have a school here, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. We'll be graduating our very first uh, 12th grade graduating class this upcoming Saturday. So we're really excited about that. One of the things we do in our school is that we've partnered with a local um, orphanage and a local foster care home to be able to let some young men and young women that are part of that foster care home in, in the foster care system go to our school for free. You know, so it's a private Christian school that, you know, with a, a, a pretty decent tuition number, but we've partnered with them to allow those students to go to our school at no cost. Um, because I really just believe that by getting a good education and a good Christian environment, that they can help change the, the course of their life. Can't go back and fix what happened in the past that caused them to end up in the foster care system. But I, I believe that being a part of our school environment, it can really help them for where God has planned for their future. That is incredible. There's such a wide scope of things that you just touched base on. Like I could go deep on each of those and let's talk more about that. It's incredible. And I just love that you're, I feel like you are such a dreamer and like want to just impact everybody. And that's incredible. And I feel like when pastors are dreamers, then other people within the church have that permission to dream as well. So like that girl with the small group, she probably learned that from your leadership of like, Hey, I can do that too. I'm going to go after my cause. So I wanted to ask like, what is kind of that, that process, maybe leadership structure of if someone has a passion what do you tell them if they want to start an outreach or, hey, I buy into that vision with the construction of those new houses? What, how do you get people plugged in and, and going in their, their passion? What, how does that work for you guys? Well, uh, probably the biggest avenue for people to really live out that passion is through our small groups. Um, we, we do small groups in a similar fashion to uh, some of the other, other churches, Church of the Highlands and others that do it in, in a semester format. And so we really encourage people in a free market kind of a way to take whatever is the passion of your heart, turn it into a small group. And so we have small groups that cover almost every gamut you can think of um, with, with people that are really taking the passion that they have to reach uh, men or women for teenagers. Uh, we have some that are re revolve around sports and other activities. We really encourage people to take their passion and turn it into a small group. And a lot of times what happens is out of that small group, we get a group of people that are like-minded, have a similar passion, that are now ready to reach out and launch some larger ministry that in, in many cases, we either keep it under our umbrella if they want it to be and it, and it fits, or we give them you know, the support and, and help them get going to, to launch it on their own. Um, actually, uh, one of the things that we're getting ready to launch is something that uh, we're calling Hope Cottage. Uh, and it's a, it's a home for, for, for women that have come through and uh, have, uh, have been tempted with abortion or have considered abortion, uh, but, but don't really have any other, uh, other options. You know, maybe their, their parents have kind of shunned them and said, we're not going to associate with you anymore, or maybe they just don't have the resources. And rather than just say, don't abort the child, we want to have a place where they can come and both mother and child when they're born, be able to have a safe haven where we can teach them mothering skills, parenting skills. Um, we can help give them a safe place until the child is born. And then even after the child is born, be able to help that mother get back on her feet. Maybe it's finishing off her education. Maybe it is, um, you know, getting into the workforce to, to generate enough income where she really can take care of herself and her child. And what's amazing is this is, I, I'm spilling all this out to you, but this is not even an idea that came from me. It's actually one of the, the admin assistants on my staff formed a small group to help 
help minister to orphans. I mean, that was their passion. The, the passion of their heart was to, 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 to orphan care. And out of that, she came and presented to me this idea of this Hope Cottage. And while she's sitting there talking to me, I, I mean, I got tears rolling down my eyes because everything she's saying is bearing witness with my spirit. And I asked her, I said, is this something you really feel like you're supposed to do on your own? If so, we'll support you in it. But if you, if you feel like it's something that you're supposed to do in conjunction with us, then we'll figure out together how do we all make this happen. And so we now got them looking for grants and, and other things to, to be a part of getting this off the ground. But it, it's amazing to see how, you know, as a visionary, I have the big vision. But then when people are really connected to the heart of that vision, God will give them other pieces of it that I didn't even have. And they end up talking about it, and it just connects, you know, like a puzzle piece to something that God wants us to do as a team. So now we're rallying behind that. And she's an admin assistant on our team right now, but eventually she'll be the director of our Hope Cottage and running in a significant part of our, our vision because it's something that she had in her heart and she was able to articulate it through taking enough time through small group. Oh my gosh, I'm going to start crying. That is incredible. <laughs> and I think it's so cool how that that is what ministry and God's work is supposed to look like. Like he doesn't give each person a picture, the full picture. He gives everybody a piece of it. And when we're working together in harmony and unity, that's the whole world is going to get reached when we do it the right way. It's incredible. I just, I love, um, I love that heart of just empowering people. And I think it's, it's so cool when we, when you have that, like some, some leaders, it might be hard to like empower and trust people to be able to run after their dreams. Cause it, can be a little scared like what if that fails it's going to be on me oh my gosh but when you are so secure in who God's called you to be and you know that the vision is right and you're following his spirit to be able to give people permission to just flow and feel empowered there is nothing more exhilarating than that just to feel like we're all moving in this direction with our whole heart so just such a beautiful picture that you're painting like I'm like this is too good to be true that's incredible and how um, Pastor Dino talks about in his upcoming book that's coming soon, um, talks about how there's phases of serving and loving your city. And it's basically like it starts with things like acts of kindness in small groups. And then it becomes like a consistent presence all the way up to like a stage three type thing where it's a permanent presence. And that's what Hope Cottage would be is kind of like, you know, they have dream centers, they have discipleship programs. It's just like there's an evolution of it and God blesses it. And it becomes something that genuinely changes cities and states and everything else in people's lifetimes. So, so cool just to hear like real life examples of what I've been learning um, lately. It's incredible. So um, tell me a little bit about what you guys are planning for Serve Day. I know you said y'all were planning, you're working with Red Cross, which is awesome. Um, Serve Day, you guys have a Serve Drive and a Serve Sunday. Are those all together? Tell me about this. I'm like geeking out like crazy. I'm like, this is incredible. So just tell me what y'all got going. <laughs> well, our, our serve day activities are, are, are pretty consistent with um, and what you guys are doing there from, from, from home base. And we you know, kind of take most of our cues from there. We have about 30, I think last count, I think about 38 to 40 oper different opportunities for people to sign up for. And we always start, first of all, before we open up to the general public, we give our small group leaders a chance to sign up first, get first dibs, as well as our dream team. And then after our small groups and dream team have first opportunity to sign up, then we open it up to the general public. And so on Saturday, the 14th of July, along with everybody else, we'll have teams dispatched all over the city. We do a big rally on serve day. Uh, we just bought a, a, a department store. It's a former department store here at a, at a local mall, about 190,000 square feet that we're getting ready to renovate. We're getting in position to renovate it. But out, right out in front, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a main thoroughfare right there here in the city. Right out in front in the main parking lot, we do a big rally on serve day. So everybody that's going to the different locations, we ask everybody to meet at the central location first and we just fire them up. We have uh, mascots, um, usually one of the, the, the Jackson DeVille mascot for the Jaguars or um, our, our Jacksonville baseball team, minor league baseball team. We have some of the mascots that'll come out and we have folks high-fiving them as, as they show up, just, just firing everybody up before we go out, um, have a little, little praise time out there in the parking lot, and just kind of reminding everybody the why behind what we do. Then everybody dispatches to all the different serve locations we have throughout the city. And so that's pretty much what we do on serve day. And one of the things we're doing this year is we actually are partnering with other churches in our city too. I mean, Celebration Church here with Pastor Stovall Williams is in Jacksonville. 
And when I say they do an amazing job, I mean, they do a, an amazing job in the city. Um, Tim Stair is here uh, with Elevate Life Church out in um, the uh, Orange Park area. And we have a couple other uh, really strong church. Church of 1122 is in our area. And what we found last year is that on serve day, we were bumping into several other churches that we know at some of the same locations. So we were going to feed the homeless or going to help uh, sort clothing at a, at, a, at a clothing drive. And we're bumping into this, to some of their people. So rather than have it be accidental, excuse me, <clears throat> accidental, we've teamed up this year and we're doing it on purpose. So we, you know, we're going out with Celebration Church for some of our activities and with Elevate Life Church and Church of 1122. And so we really love that part because this year is not just our group serving, it's our group serving and we're making it a body of Christ issue that we're all coming together. You know, we have some of our events that we're doing with just our team because they're smaller events, but some of the bigger ones that we're doing where they need hundreds of volunteers rather than have our folks showing up and we didn't even know that some of our friends from across town were going to be there. We, we partner with them. So our outreach director and celebrations outreach director are working together to plan out some activities that we can all do together. And uh, I think it's good for us to not only have that chance to serve, but I think it's just good for the overall unity of the body of Christ. And so that's what's taking place for us on, on serve day. And then we turn the day after serve day into serve Sunday. So we're, we'll have our videographers out collecting video footage and uh, they'll, edit it up throughout the evening and uh, that next day is going to be a real celebration of what took place during our serve day and they're uh, really given some some extra space in our service to be able to give some testimonies to basically say thank you to everybody for taking time out to go and serve and really give us a chance to to, to really thank God and thank thank one another for the the opportunity we had to, to serve that day and, and another thing we want to do is we want to we don't want to just be an event for that day we want to use that momentum and spin it out on that Sunday for people to sign up to be a part of our, our outreach team on a regular basis, to have a chance to go out regularly to serve. Uh, we're getting ready to open a, we partnered with the city. There was an abandoned, two, two abandoned buildings in our city and a park that had just sat in an in a underserved neighborhood forever. And we've been working with the city for the last two years to get the city to give us control of those buildings. Let us, let us set up some dream team, dream team type of uh, function, dream center type of functions in those buildings. And two weeks ago, we just signed the paperwork for us to, to gain ownership. So one of the served locations is going to be our team there helping to rehab those properties with our contractors. And we're looking to get in position where we can set up to do food, to do medical services for that, uh, that community right there. We're going to be able to do parenting classes and computer classes. And so part of our serve time this year is going to be getting in position where we can be ready to, to open that thing up in the fall and, and really serve that community better. Oh my gosh, you keep like blowing my mind. Like there's one more level and then there's another level and there's another, like, good Lord, two dream centers. Okay, amazing. I am so, oh my gosh, you don't even know. I wanted to go back though. You said, when you said the thing about partnering with the other churches in the area, I love that you're bumping into each other. That's an awesome problem. But we're like, that's our heart for Serve Day. And it's like this year's one of, I don't know. I think this year is really becoming a lot of that. We're seeing churches wanting to work together in their community. Um, some of them have been asking me like, hey, that map's not on the website. Where's it at? Because we flipped our website over. Like, where's the map? We want to know who else is in our community we can work with. But what would you say to churches who are wanting to work together but don't quite know how to start? Maybe they haven't been part of our meetups yet. Maybe they're a new launch and they're just looking to reach out but don't know how. Um, and then just logistically, like, of course, like somebody's got to take care of all the details. How does that work? Partnering this and that. What would you, what would your advice be if they want to see something like that work? What would you tell them? Well, so, I mean, some of the larger churches, I think it's probably easier for us to coordinate those things. Like with, with us in Celebration, we just kind of put our outreach directors together and they worked out kind of what makes sense for, for us to do together. Uh, maybe a smaller church, a new church plant, or one that's you know may may, may still be growing and, and developing uh, with, with an outreach team and all of that. One of the things I would encourage them to do is just reach out to a church like us, Impact Church, or Celebration, or or um, Elevate Life Church out out there with Tim Stair, because all all three of these are churches that I know are have a passion for the community um, and have a passion for the the, the kingdom of God. Um, so we'd love to have any other churches that want to be involved and, 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 and be able to go out on some of the projects we have and they could send somebody from their team to collect their own footage and, and be able to put together their own kind of report to their church about it. But, it. but sometimes it's easier when you already have a church that has existing relationships 
because uh, some of the places we're going this year are places we've gone in the last two years. And we're able to now just come back with a new team, with new projects. And so it'd probably be good for them to connect with a church like ours and be able to send their team out and, and, and be a part of it. And, and, and I, think, I think the other thing it does for a, a younger church, too, is it gives you a lot of momentum. Uh, one of the things that we did in the early days was try our best to, to, to always connect with a church that was further ahead than us because it just stirred our people up with excitement about where we were headed and, and it caught the vision a lot, a lot faster. So I think that'd be a great idea for some of those smaller churches. And if, if y'all want to recommend us to anybody that, you know, may be looking to connect in this local area, then we'd certainly be glad to, to partner with them. That's super awesome. Thank you for that. I know that's going to be valuable for many people. Um, and I think it's, it, people might think I'm um, a new church and it's very humbling to reach out and partner with someone, but it's not any less. It adds so much value to be able to be in that relationship and learn. And it strengthens the entire community because you're all there to love that same area and those same people. So um, it just, and it speaks like the scripture that says that they'll know that we're Christians by our love for each other. Like that is exactly what this is in motion. So super cool and just I love that you have that friendship with those pastors it's it's cool to hear um so thank you for that um anything else like as far as local outreach and missions um that is unique that we would need to know about that you would want to share a word of advice for maybe a church who again like is starting up from scratch and they just don't know quite maybe their small group structure isn't in place yet, but they want to get moving. Um, what, what would be some of your first yeses and first steps to tell them to take? Well, one thing, one thing I would say, if, you know, if I had to do this whole journey all over again, is that we would have gotten started having a real community initiative a lot earlier. I mean, honestly, from day one, I would have started out from the first day we opened the church with something in place for our people to uh, be thinking in terms of reaching our community. It's one of the things that happened with us is that we went for probably 16 years or so as a church, 15 years, and I think we were so inwardly focused. You know, we were focused uh, on, on, on us and, and, and how the, the, the word benefits us and how we grow and mature. And I think, you know, with a good heart, we always had an outreach team. We always did some type of missions work. I think we kind of relegated the outreach to the outreach team and let the rest of the church off the hook. And I think that the rest of the church as a whole really kind of became a bit selfish. So uh, in fact, one year I stood up on, in, in January and said, my mission, my, my sole mission for this year is to kill the selfish spirit in our church. <laughs> it's to slay the selfish spirit. And uh, you know, starting from the pulpit all the way to the parking lot, I, just, I want us to get to the place where we're not thinking me first or even my family first. We're thinking, what can I do for somebody else? And, and I love to say that it, you know, I've completely eradicated it, but, you know, it still pops up at times and in me and in others as well. But today, our church today, compared to our church seven or eight years ago, we're a totally different church. And uh, it does my heart well that so many of the outreach endeavors that we do don't get, don't start from the, from the administrative office. It gets started by, by people in the church. I mean, one of the things that blessed me more than anything else is two years ago with Serve Day, one of our biggest events was a, a feeding the homeless event in downtown Jacksonville. And it wasn't anything that we did. It was, I had two young adults, like 18 and 19. They had just graduated from our, our student ministry as a boyfriend, girlfriend. And they, they, they had a, a vision to feed the homeless in downtown and we're going about doing it all on their own. We got wind of it and decided to partner with them. So we sent a bunch of our students down there, a lot of our student leaders and volunteers to help undergird them in their project. Turned out to be one of the best projects we had during Serve Day, but it started with two teenagers, I mean, barely out of, out of our high school group. And so that's, that's one of those inspiring stories that is just a reminder to keep building culture. So if I were talking to a young church planter or somebody with a new church, I would just encourage them, don't sit back and wait till your church gets to a certain size before we start serving the community. Serve where you are. You know, start with what you have, what you have to offer. Even if it's uh, once a month or once a quarter, taking your, your, your church and rallying to go down to a homeless shelter or rallying to go down and help clean up a nursing home, uh, rallying to go, I mean, rallying to go out. One, one of the things that we did years ago that was a big success is that we went through our neighborhood and gathered the names of all the senior citizens in our neighborhood. And we sent out a letter to them, letting them know that on this one particular day, we were gonna send teams out to come and just serve them in their house. So if they had any projects at their house that they had been wanting to have done, then we were sending teams out. So we, we sent it ahead of time so they wouldn't think it was some scam or somebody just showing up there at their house to take advantage of them. 
And so we came out, we cleaned gutters out. Um, I, I had you know, guys that had construction backgrounds that, 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 that helped to rebuild uh, patios for some of these families. We had one home I remember that the backyard looked like a forest. It hadn't been cut or trimmed in so long. They went through and cleaned it out, did, did landscaping for families. And to see the looks on some of these seniors' faces that are out there in tears because for the first time somebody came and helped them with something that they didn't have the money to pay for anymore and didn't have the strength to get out there and do it on their own. So that was one of those projects that even when we were younger and really just learning to get, to get involved in our community that we took upon ourselves to do. So even if I were, we were a small church of, uh, you know, just a hundred people or 200 people, that's still one of those projects. You can get 15 or 20 people together that are willing to go out and help, help the neighborhood. You might not be able to do 50 homes, maybe to do five or six initially to start off. But I mean, those families just knowing that that church down the street cares enough to come and help. And what, what ends up happening is not only did you help that family, but the neighbors hear about it. Their children come over and see that their parents' home is in much better shape than it was last time they came. They hear about it. And it helps people to realize that that church is about more than just Bible lessons and trying to change your life spiritually. The church actually cares enough to come into the community to help you out. So good. I like that a lot. Just how, um, being able to just say yes, like you don't have to have a plan in place and have this perfect strategy. Cause I've talked to, sometimes it is intimidating. Like, Oh, we're, we're, we haven't even launched yet. We're not ready to just go out and serve the community, but that is the key to being able to grow and have that life. And um, it's so cool that your story, like you were able to change the culture shift or work on a shift in culture 16 years into it. So there's hope, even if you're a church who hasn't had serving in the history um, or that wasn't a big focus, it's still possible. It's harder and it takes a lot more bravery. It sounds like, but either way there's hope and it's important and it's vital and it brings so much life. Like I know you've seen it. I've seen it a million times, just how it completely changes everything. Everybody's got more joy everybody's more alive it's just it's worth it and it's worth it because heaven gets bigger and people people are saved their eternities are saved like that's the biggest thing so that's what, what's amazing too is that it, it it benefits the people that we're out to serve but i think it benefits us even more it does. i think it helps you everybody to go home and realize just how much we need to be grateful for uh, i make it a point on serve day that my kids have to be a part of it's got a 16 year old daughter a 14 year old son and a 10 year old son and we make sure that they're out and a part of Serve Day as well, um, because I think it's just important for them to realize just how blessed they are and that you know, God doesn't bless us just for us to sit and count our blessings and, and tweet about our blessings and Snapchat about our blessings. He blessed us so we can turn around and be in position to be a blessing to somebody else. And uh, I, I, mean, I, I think we've done a pretty good job. I don't know if we've done a great job, but I, we've worked really hard to make sure our children don't get stuck in a selfish mode of thinking that we're blessed just for ourselves. But we want our, our kids to be well-rounded to where they know that the blessings that rest on our family, the favor that, that we experience, whatever level of notoriety that comes with, with our family, it's all intended just to be a bigger platform for us to look to serve somebody else. That's beautiful. I love that you said that, just the heart of being in tune with others, being in tune with their hearts, how important that is for ourselves and for them. Um, and I didn't want to let this time pass. I know this could be like a whole other discussion and talk, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but I didn't want to let the time pass without asking you. Um, you were part of that panel that talked about race in America and just the challenges that we're going through and just how it's so important to learn from one another and to be able to have humble discussions and talk and understand. And my personal heart, like I love just learning other people's stories and understanding their context and what they've gone through. And sometimes there's just oblivion. Like I've asked a friend who is of a different background, different race, like, Hey, have you ever been made to feel less? And the stories that I got back blew my mind. Like I had no idea that there were things like that going on day to day, people getting treated that way. I would never personally treat someone that way, but there's just like, ignorance and it's not like my it's not like a an intentional fault but it's something that we can actively pursue learning about one another learning about the challenges that each other are going through so what with the, I know there's so many we could go really deep and take a whole nother hour to talk about this stuff, so I don't want to make you go too deep on it but just tell me a little bit about First of all, how to strike up conversations, whether it's about race specifically or it's about just different stories. How do you go to that level without making it weird and awkward, 
but you just want to learn about someone else to hear their story and to understand. And then also um, just, well, answer that one first and I'll, then I'll go to the next one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I ramble. <laughs> Well, I think I think the starting point is uh, kind of the the Book of Acts, Acts one one eight model. You, know, you should be witnesses in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. I think where we get into trouble is if we try to start these real intimate conversations with people that are a part of our uttermost parts of the earth. So I think it's best to start like you have. Uh, you've had these kind of conversations with people that you're close to. Um, it's amazing that you didn't run into a perfect stranger in the grocery store and try to strike up this conversation. Right. Because we intuitively know that this is it's kind of like religion and politics. I mean, it's one of those that, well, you don't really want to just dive into that with somebody you don't have that kind of relational capital with. And I think the best place to start are with the people that we have some level of closeness with. So if that's a group of friends we have uh, and, and, and the best way to start it is from that educational approach. I just don't know there, there are things that I can be doing or saying that are just ignorant. And it's only because I don't know. I, I, thought, I thought Miles McPherson did an amazing job in conveying that truth at the, our conference because he really just kind of attacked some of the, not, not, not individuals, but attacked the, the areas of ignorance that we all have, all of us have. I will never know what it's like to be in your shoes. I'll never know what it's like to be a, a female who's got a little baby growing on the inside of them and all the stuff that comes along with that. So I can end up making some unfair or ignorant statements or have some ignorant assumptions just because I don't know. But if I sit down and have a conversation with you, and if we're close enough for you to take time to really tell me what that experience is about, now, though I can never sit in your shoes, I can at least walk with a level of empathy to try to understand and be considerate of what your experience is. Same thing is true when it comes to uh, racial matters or matters of ethnicity. We'll never know what it's like to sit in one another's shoes. But when you have close family members or close friends that you can have those conversations with that allow you to be ignorant for a moment while they try to educate you from their perspective. Um, I did this with, with our church. You know, uh, cause we, we've had from day one, our goal has been we want to have a church that looks like heaven. I've always said that from the first day we started. And it hasn't always been that way. I mean, our church has been 99% African-American you know, for the majority of our time. And one of the things I had to do probably about seven or eight years ago that started us diversifying our congregation is I had to be willing to ask some questions because it's not enough just to have a good heart. And I think that's part of the problem is that a lot of times we think everybody else's heart is like ours. I don't, I don't, I don't have a desire to ever be racist, demonstrate any level of racism. And I'm sure you'd say the same thing. But just because that's in our heart doesn't mean that we're not sometimes doing some things out of ignorance with just, just without knowing. So I sat down with a, with a diverse group of, of members of my church. And as we were attacking this whole, how do we become more diverse? I had to ask them, tell me, what are some of the things that we are doing as a church? Some of the things that I may be doing when I'm communicating truth that may make it difficult for us to diversify. And I had, I had a couple people, you know, uh, ca Caucasian young ladies that were part of my group that, that shared with me and say, well, pastor, we love you preaching and teaching, but every now and then there's some illustrations you'll use and we have no idea what you're talking about. You know, one in particular, you know, I would always use this little joke where I talk about, you know, we all got that family member, you know, Ray Ray, Junebug, uh, Junebug or Pookie. That makes perfect sense in the, in the inner city African-American community. But and, and one I would say, Pastor, I love it, but I have no idea who you're talking about <laughs> when you talk about Ray Ray and Junebug and Pookie. Well, in, in the inner city African-American, almost everybody's got at least one family member or friend who is either named Ray Ray, <laughs> Junebug, Pookie, or one of those nicknames. And so I was making total sense to my African-American crowd, but I was not making any sense at all to the majority of my white, Hispanic, and Indian, and Asian that were there. And, and so what, what I've learned to do is I can still tell a great story, have a lot of humor in it, but make it more applicable, not just to who's sitting there today, but who I'm believing God to have sitting there later on. And I think that's just one small example on the preaching side, on the ministry side of how it's just necessary for us to open up ourselves beyond ourselves. The truth of the matter is we only know what we know and we'll never know more than what we know unless we open ourselves up to other information. And sometimes people that can show us our blind spots and maybe share something with us that we wouldn't actually see on our own. That's such great wisdom there. Um, amazing. I, I just want to say like, it's been kind of, heavy on my heart. I don't know exactly when it came to me, but just thinking about 
how much, like, I can get mad. Like you said, like, someone might not understand my situation, so they ask a stupid question and make me feel dumb, and I'm just like, that was rude. You shouldn't have asked that. You shouldn't have said that, and it's just like, it just takes so much grace. Like, if we can just have a minute to be like, that person just doesn't know quite yet. It takes grace, and I want to say thank you, because I know that there's probably been situations where you've had to choose grace and say, that person just doesn't know, and so, I think for all of us, like you said, there's always a different context and we all have different stories and backgrounds. Just if we can all choose that and then actively, proactively seek understanding and be intentional. I think I'm realizing that too. Like it takes you stepping out and being bold and saying, hey, tell me what I don't know and being tactical and not just going up to the person in the grocery store. But just, um, I think that the body of Christ is getting to be more and more beautiful. We think the, the world is dark, it's getting darker, but the body of Christ is becoming so much more beautiful. And I think it's exciting to be part of that. So thank you for your encouragement and words of wisdom there. That's very enlightening. Um, I know we have, we have about five more minutes. So I was going to ask two things. If there's anything else, like um, word of advice, a fresh dream on your heart personally that we can be praying for um, just anything like a last closing thought and then how we can get in touch with your team. If someone has follow-up questions of anything you shared about today, the best way to get in touch. Sure. Um, certainly would greatly appreciate the uh, prayers of those that are uh, watching this. Um, uh, probably the biggest thing that's on my heart that we really can appreciate the prayers on. I mentioned earlier, we just bought a 190,000 square foot building uh, sitting right inside of an existing mall here uh, in Jacksonville. One has gone through some, some tougher times, but we're really believing to be a part of the revitalization of that mall. And so that's, that's an area of wisdom and, and resources that we're standing and believing God for. So I certainly appreciate you all joining us in faith for that. Uh, we know that God doesn't ever give vision without also accompanying it with provision. So we know the provision is there. We know all the wisdom and favor that we need in the renovation process is there. But certainly I greatly appreciate the, the prayers of our, our spiritual family to help us to mine that wisdom and, and resources that we need to, to pull that off. Um, and then I, I really would just uh, encourage anybody that they're looking to get in touch with us. Um, they can go to our website, which is icjax.com, um, icjax.com, and uh, our contact information is there. Um, our outreach director is uh, Joy Hervey, J-O-Y, last name Hervey, H-E-R-V-E-Y. Uh, she's the one who handles all of our outreach and missions efforts, and her email is real simple. It's jhervey at icjax.com jhervey at icjax.com. So if they have any uh, missions or outreach specific questions, she's the right person to reach out to. But if there's anything in general that they'd like to know or like to be able to reach out and contact us about something else, and certainly there's contact information there on our website. Perfect. That is wonderful. Thank you so very much for taking time. Again, like just so much honor to you and your team and um, the wisdom and the stories that you have shared today have been enlightening beyond reason. And I'm so excited to watch it back and share it with the world. So if it's okay, I'll close out in prayer and then we'll get back to our day. Okay? Thank you. Jesus, thank you so much, Father for Bishop George Davis and his wonderful family and his wonderful team. God, I thank you for um, his family just following the calling from Detroit down to Florida, God, and just the incredible vision that you've given them, the anointing you've given them to reach um, their city, their state, and the world, Lord. I pray that you will just continue to anoint them, that the vision that you give them, we know is from you, God, those dreams are from you, and you're going to the one to provide everything that needs to happen to make those dreams come true because it's your dream god not theirs um we get to be part of just making your dreams come true and that's such an honor i pray that you just give them peace give them wisdom and just give them continued joy let it be fun let their team have continued generosity and unity father um I just pray that you use them like never before, that this year is a big year. It sounds like they've had lots of big years, but let this one be one that is historical, that they look back on and they're like, wow, that was a turning point for something even bigger and greater than they could have ever imagined. Uh, thank you for the time that Bishop Davis gave with us today. Pray you anoint his day, God, and the words that he says and the things that he does and the people that he serves. Just go before him and... Um, do a special blessing to just his family together. I don't know what it is, but just let there be something really cool and special ahead for them. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Blessing. Have a great week. You too. Bye-bye.